Hey YouTubers, I'm here to help you uh, decipher some research. I've recently uh, fielded many emails uh, questioning some of the SMA programs that are out there, published papers, what to expect. Um, and I think it's important to, to put together videos so, so parents can uh, look at things and, and break down the research for themselves, help to answer some of your questions. And if you just happen to be at, let's say, a researcher meeting, you can ask uh, vital pertinent questions. Um, but what I wanted to start out with is, um, is showing you that there's so much contradiction to research that's out there. Um, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Recently, I, I've received um, two articles, two websites that were uh, promoted by the NIH um, to show that, that up to 50% of academic research cannot be duplicated. Uh, in the business of marketing and trying to find funding, um, some programs, uh, well, 50 percent, um, overpromise uh, or, or tend to just highlight the good information on their data and hide the negative information. So what I want to do through a series of videos is show you the different programs uh, for SMA and uh, look at the different uh, research papers that are, that are published on each one of these uh, programs and, and help you to, to formulate your, your own ideas of what's promising, what's not promising, uh, where you would like to send your money, okay? Um, so the first article I wanted to show you, and I'll provide all the links in the description below the video, is, uh, is this article. Uh, it's called why animal research needs to improve. So uh, what this says is um, essentially as a result they tend to report only the outcomes that happen to show statistical significance reducing a rigorous hypothesis testing experiment to something more like observational research. The tendency to publish only positive results is another flaw in animal research. Such bias not only prevents scientists from getting credit for high quality research that happens to be neutral, but also gives a false impression of efficacy. So th there's another article that was uh, uh, put out that I received in a link through the NIH, and I tried to uh, update it uh, via PubMed, but it only gave you a, a small description, and that, that article you know, stated the 50%. Um, inability to duplicate research findings in, a, in an academic lab. Um, this one is, is academic bias and biotech failures. Once again, I'll provide all these links. And this is a gentleman's blog. In this blog, uh, he highlights the unspoken rule is that at least 50% of the studies published, even in top tier academic journals, science, nature, cell, PNAS, etc., can't be repeated. Grants are really competitive and careers are on the line. Only positive findings are typically published, not negative ones. This pressure creates a huge con conflict of interest for academics and a strong bias to write papers that support the hypothesis included in grant applications and prior publications. So if it's your career and, and you're dependent on funding, um, the pressure is on to get into uh, a really um, well-respected uh, publication, such as the ones mentioned. And some researchers, not all, will, will hide their negative data just to get published. You know, I think the advantage of the highly respected uh, sites, like the ones that I, that I, publications like I mentioned, is that, for instance, Nature, Nature goes through uh, a peer review. So when you submit your article, uh, other experts in the field uh, will dissect your information and, and report back before it gets published. So if, if it's if if you do get good ratings, it'll be published. If not, you know you probably won't make it into uh, Nature. Uh, and I think even that fifty percent of those cannot be duplicated in, in outside of the academic facility. So when you look at research papers that are published on the internet in regards to our disease and other diseases. Um, if they're not one of the high tier uh, publication and they do not go through peer review, uh, you're on your own as, as far as uh, whether that, that data is, is important or not. 
Um, I, I wanted to show you an article. I, I came up on Google Alerts, so I, I took a look at it. And I kind of wanted to show you um, differences in reporting, uh, even though they do a general um, uh, highlight of SMA research, I, I think you'll get the idea of um, maybe uh, not a balanced reporting for all programs, let's say, in my opinion. So we're going to take a look at something that was uh, Discovery Medicine. And it was an uh, article published in the author account of James P. Van Meerbeek. I think I'm... And it's called The Progress and Promise, The Current Status of Spinal Muscular Atrophy Therapeutics. The department, this is the institution of the Department of Neurology, the Johns Hopkins University of School and Medicine. So in this paper, uh, we see um, a highlight on different therapies that have been tried, what's in the pipeline. Um, so here it states, as VPA and phenylbutyrate are in clinical use for other indications. They were both taken to clinical trials in SMA patients quickly, despite their low potency as HDAC uh, IC inhibitors. Recent results from these studies in SMA type 2 and type 3 patients have shown little or no effect. And there were three papers that were published that, that support this. So uh, it was Mercury et al., 2007, Swoboda et al., 2010, and Kissel et al. 2011, okay? So um, here it, it says that VPA was used and, uh, you know, they, it didn't show any effect. Um, so they're highlighting some of the negatives of, of that program. So if you go down further, they also discuss uh, hydroxyurea. So in this article, uh, they say hydroxyurea was shown to increase the ratio of full length uh, to truncated SMN mRNA in SMA patient-derived cell lines. And uh, that was Liang et al. 2008. So they, they're citing the, the papers where these results came from. Um, but later on in the paragraph, they also show the negative. Uh, a placebo-controlled double-blind study was recently published that contradicted this finding, showing no improvements in the motor function of full-length SMN transcript levels of SMA type 2 and 3 patients after hydroxyurea uh, treatment. So you see they, they, they give the negatives to the program. Um, then we move to quinazoline, and it says quinazoline derivatives were originally found to increase SMN2 promoter activity in a screen over 500,000 compounds in an NSC34 cell-based screening assay. And uh, they use uh, Jarecki et al., 2005, Jill Jarecki. In a secondary screening, they increased SMN protein levels and gem number in SMA patients derived fibroblasts, Jarecki et al., 2005. It showed good CNS penetration and a long half-life following oral dosing in mice. Our laboratory has confirmed a 29% increase uh, in median survival and a 15% increase in maximum body weight achieved in severe SMA mice using the current lead quinazoline uh, derivative, Van Merbeek et al. 2011. And it goes on to say the phase one clinical trials uh, with this compound have been initiated. However, um, I don't see any... Um, any of the negative side effects on, on, on this trial. Um, what wasn't mentioned in that paragraph was um, that they couldn't go into uh, first day, second day, third or fourth day mice because it was too toxic. So they had to go into uh, a fourth day um, administration of, of the compound, which led to a three-day survival. Now, remember, this program has seen $15 million in funding. Um, so would I have included that in my uh, synopsis of the program? Yeah, but um, it wasn't included in this paper. Um, then they go into repurposed drugs, salbutamol, uh, which is the oral albuterol. It says there was an increase, uh, larger randomized placebo controlled trials and needed to further evaluate the efficacy of this drug in SMA. Question, does oral albuterol cross the blood-brain barrier, we have to, you know, realize what the target is. The target is the motor neurons. So uh, although we may have some off-targeting with some of these compounds um, that benefit the disease, um, the major target is the a, is a, is a spinal cord motor neurons, right? The skeletal muscles. Um, so, you know, do we see a little bit of benefit? Yes. Is this is a larger study going to prove that uh, this is a wonderful thing for SMA? 
I highly doubt it. But that's just my opinion. Um, here's another article on um, PTC, they, PTC Therapeutics. So they do do a good job on highlighting many of the uh, SMA programs. And it says um, PTC Therapeutics, they have identified three different structural scaffolds that each increase SMN protein levels and extend median survival of S severe SMA mice in one case from 14 to 132 days. 132 days. These compounds are orally bioavailable and can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Very important. But the mechanism, see, here's the caveat, right? But the mechanism by which they alter SMN splicing has not yet been described. Narishkin et al. 2011. So you see, they, they, they highlight some of the benefits. And then on certain programs, they highlight the negatives. Um, I, I rank PTC Therapeutics, my opinion, as... Um, one of the three most promising uh, SMA programs out there. I, I tend not to, if a program doesn't surpass that 100-day survival in the SMA mouse, I, I really won't look at it. I won't fund it. You know, we, we, we now have a new bar. You know, we have three different programs that have surpassed 100-day survival in the Delta 7 mouse. So this is one of them, and uh, it, it seems to be very promising. Um, you know, we'll have to see when more data comes out, but definitely top three, in my opinion. And then we go into antisense oligonucleotides. Another strategy that has been pursued to increase exon 7 inclusion is the use of antisense oligonucleotides, modified nucleotides that bind specific mRNA sequences. So I, I don't go through everything. I just highlight parts that I wanted to pick out to you, uh, which they have shown in collaboration with Adrian Craner's laboratory and Genzyme is able to correct ear and tail necrosis. Um, in a mild ma mouse model of SMA and extend median survival in severe SMA mice from 16 to 26 days after ICV injection, right, into cranial, into the brain. Um, 10 days. Right, you've heard a lot about the uh, oligonucleotides. Here's a 10-day survival. Um, and that, that's Hua et al. 2010, Pacini et al. 2011. I hope I'm saying these names right. Pacini et al. 2011 also provided proof of principal evidence for clinical relevance of this drug documented uh, putatively therapeutic ASL levels in the spinal cords of cinemacolis monkeys after intrathecal delivery. So when it went into the, um, the spinal fluid. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, recent data show an even more striking benefit when ASO 1027 is given systemically in severe SMA mice. Systemically. Notice uh, what we funded for the gene therapy was systemic administration. And here's another therapy showing that systemically they receive better results, right? You, you're targeting, it crosses blood-brain barrier targets the uh, skeletal muscles and also off targets, right? So the enhanced benefit with systemic delivery suggests the requirement to restore SMN in other tissues aside from the central nervous system. Whether this is relevant to human disease has yet to be determined, right? There's the negative, right? When you show that systemic is the better administration, let's put a negative to it. Um, I think, uh, you know, Based on what I, 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 I've, I've read to you, you could start to you know, formulate your own conclusions here. Um, they go into gene therapy. And it says, uh, but interestingly, they go into all the published works, SCAAV9 intravenously. It says, but interestingly, delivery of the gene intravenously provided a greater survival benefit when compared to ICV injections, right, through the cranial. With six or seven severe SMA mice living past 250 days compared to a median survival of 157 days in the ICV injected mice. That's through the brain. So um, systemic was more effective in, in these studies. Uh, Faust et al. 2010, Pacini et al. 2010. Other studies have also shown dramatic extensions of life of median lifespan using IV, IV SCAAV9 delivery. Providing evidence that IV SCAAV9 injections are able to efficiently transfect the CNS in large non-human primates. Preclinical studies are ongoing to address the potential challenges of toxicity, right? Delivery and manufacturing of human clinical trials. See, when they write a paper like this, um, and we've heard this before, and uh, I questioned the researcher who presented to the community on the toxicity of the gene therapy, uh, the video was edited. They took that out. Uh, so 
uh, I want to ask uh, any researcher if, based on the systemic delivery of AAB9, uh, in any of the published articles, have you seen toxicity? Show me where it is. I mean, um, I know that if we look at the other programs, oligonucleotides, there are other programs that have shown high toxicity in the non-human primate. So the challenge with oligonucleotides was they can go in in extremely large levels of dosing to show significant results in the mouse. But once we go into a non-human primate, a much larger species, closer to a human, uh, we have seen toxicity. But that didn't show up in the, uh, in the synapsis of oligonucleotides in this paper. Um, I think what I'm going to be doing in the future is I'm going to go through every single one of these programs. I'm going to pull up all the research articles, and I'm going to show you the contradictions. So um, in the oligo on the oligonucleotides, I've seen one paper that shows a 10-day extension and uh, another uh, paper that shows a much higher extension of life. When I go in and I look at the dosing, the dosing is incredible high levels in the, um, in the animal that live longer. And then when you look at the non-human primate studies, uh, they didn't extend out the animal life. The animal uh, went in with uh, minimal dosing, dosing that would have to be higher in the humans. And these animals were taken down, I think it was six days. So if you're really doing a safety study, in my opinion, um, you would want to do a, a much longer study, right? I mean, if you smoke a cigarette today, is that going to give you cancer tomorrow? No. But it's the accumulative effect, right? So if, if you smoke packs of cigarettes every day of your life, the chances are you're going to get cancer down the road. So when you, when you do a study, right, and you show one injection, when you know that a therapy is going to need multiple injections over the course of a lifetime, has there been a study to show that? Multiple injections. Uh, in the gene therapy uh, program, the primates were injected, and uh, before they were sacrificed, they lived out six months. So, you know, to, to take an animal out six months, and that's a therapy that only needs one injection uh, based on the animal studies. So you, you let the animal live out six months to see if there's issues down the road. Six days, you're going to see anything? Uh, there's many questions to be answered. So um, this is just my initial video. I hope you find it interesting. Um, I'm going to start doing my homework for you, highlighting articles, uh, let you see the differences, and uh, you know, make up your own decision. All right? Thank you very much for listening, and uh, have a great day.